Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from Jakarta and welcome. Hope everybody is healthy and staying well. My name is Salsa and I will be the MC for today's forum. Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, or FPCI, is pleased to collaborate with National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, to convene our joint discussion series. In this exciting collaboration, FPCI and GRIPS convene monthly public forum discussing most pressing international issues, foreign policy, and world affairs. Today, our forum brings the theme of Get to Know Generation Y and Z on their influence, drives, and worldviews. Before we move forward, please allow me to welcome Ambassador Yasoya Gunasekera, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to Indonesia, Ambassador Lina Anab, Ambassador of Jordan to Japan, Ambassador Yutaka Imura, former Ambassador of Japan to Indonesia and Senior Fellow Visiting Professor at GRIPS Alliance. Welcome, Ambassadors. To start our forum, I'd like to invite Dr. Dino Patijalao, founder and chairman of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia to deliver his welcoming remarks. Dr. Dino, the floor is yours. Everybody, good afternoon. My name is Dino Patijala. I'm chairman and founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia. And I want to say welcome to everyone who's joining us today. And also I'd like to welcome Professor Kunihiko Shinoda, who is a professor and executive advisor of GRIPS Alliance at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Shinoda and his team for co-organizing this public forum with FPCI. I'm very pleased to know that under FPCI and uh, GRIPS collaboration, we have conducted two public forums so far, and today we're conducting our third public forum with the title, Get to Know Generation Y and Z on their influence, drives, and worldviews. And I think this is gonna be a very interesting topic. Uh, we will discuss more in depth about the role of Generation Y and Z in today's world, and what do they think about the global responses and cooperation uh, to global challenges. Generation Y and Z are generations that are most connected, exposed, creative, and globalized uh, in the history of humankind. Uh, we, as a generation before them, need to prepare and mentor them uh, because they are now becoming a key player who drive uh, global development and both generation will be an important actor, not in two or three decades ahead, but in this decade. Uh, for instance, in, the 20, in 2025, the combination of both generations will create more than half of Asia Pacific consumers. So these generations will shape market behavior and consumer forces that drive the direction of the market. Startup companies that are founded by millennials are expanding rapidly and turning into unicorn companies in many countries like GoTo in Indonesia and Grab in Malaysia. As we know, during the pandemic, Southeast Asian economies is saved by e-commerce and digital platforms, and these e-commerce companies are run by Generation Y and Z. And they also have more say in the political establishment. Pew Research reported that Generation Z agreed that politics has never been as influential in pop culture as it is today. And they call for more representation across a full spectrum of issues. Today, we also see more the rise of political party driven by the youth and youth political figure who uh, are getting more public attention in many countries. In Indonesia, for example, we see more political party or politicians branding themselves as a youth advocate. And all in all, the youth not only own their future, but they also uh, are uh, important actors uh, of today. So therefore, their perspective and point of view and aspiration are very important for us to know and discuss. I wish all of you a fruitful discussion, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dino, for your remarks. Now I'd like to invite Professor Kunihiko Shinoda, Professor and Executive Advisor at GRIPS Alliance, to deliver his opening remarks. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ambassador Dino Bhattijara, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. And it is a great pleasure for me to participate in the third FPCI GRIPS public forum today. Since the middle of this year, GRIPS and FPCI have been collaborating on a variety of intellectual exchange activities including online lectures and webinars. 
In this September, uh, GRIPS, GRIPS President Tanaka gave a lecture on the theme of building in the Pacific cooperation in Asia in the 21st century at the second Southeast Asia Lecture Hall organized by FPCI. The event was attended by 2,500 uh, 2, students, including RIP students. FCCI has a wide network with universities, indigenous cities, as well as capital cities in Southeast Asian countries. And I was very much impressed by the various questions raised by the young students with deep insight. GRIPS has been cooperating with FPCI as a university partner in the management of large symposiums uh, such as the Global Town Hall uh, held by FPCI on November 20th. And I was very happy to hear that uh, 12,000 people uh, from all over the world attended the symposium uh, this year. Uh, GRIPS is also co-hosting the FPCI GRIPS public forum with FPCI five times from October this year to February next year. The two previous FPCI GRIPS public forums were held under the themes of opportunities and challenges for peace and stability in the, in the Indo-Pacific region and the Asian century uh, projection, expectation, reality, where active discussions were held on Asian politics, security, and economy. In the third FPCI GRIPS forum, under the theme of get to know generation Y and Z on their influence, dynamics, and world views, we will have moderators and panelists from various backgrounds, such as TV news anchors, parliament members, uh, presidential special staff, marketing strategists, and NPO social activists from Indonesia and Japan. As for myself, I hesitate to say that I belong to the baby boomers, two generations above Generation Y. And I'm like a symbol of Japanese society are facing the problem of declining birth rate and aging population. In Asia, not only Japan, but also China and South Korea in Northeast Asia, and some countries in Southeast Asia like Singapore and Thailand will be facing the same problem of declining birth rate and aging population in the near future. In this context, younger generations such as Generation Y and Z are expected to become the core of consumer society and support economic growth in Asian countries in the future. Generations Y and Z are connected to each other via internet and social media across countries and are actively sending out information and taking concrete actions to solve various issues facing the economy and society in Asia. In Asia, in addition to pandemics and aging population with low birth rates, there are various issues such as climate change, clean energy, industry 4.0, and women's empowerment. Japan is also promoting the Asia Digital Transformation Initiative with other Asian countries, where Japanese companies and Asian digital platforms and startups are working together to solve these social issues using digital technology. I strongly hope that many young people will participate in these efforts. I'm looking forward to listening to candid discussions of young generation experts from Japan and Asia with various backgrounds on social activities of uh, Generation Y and Z. I'd like to conclude my opening remarks by wishing that many of the audience members who participated in the public forum uh, will continue to participate in the various intellectual exchange programs uh, jointly organized by FPCI and GRIPS in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shinoda. Before we start the discussion, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Timothy Marwun. Timothy Marwun is an Indonesian news anchor, news reader, and executive producer for several TV programs at Kompas TV. He was nominated for 2017's Indonesia's Best News Anchor by the Indonesian Broadcast Commission. Without further ado, I'd like to pass over the floor to Timothy to moderate the discussion. Over to you, Mas Timothy. All right, thanks, Asabila. Hi, everyone. I'm Timothy. Uh, that was a short introduction, but yes, I do news television. So that's me in short. Uh, it's, a, it's a joy for me to join everyone here. Uh, as we know, 
the topic was also very interesting. So once again, I'd like to say hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This is the third FPCI GRIPS public forum as, as also introduced, introduced to us in the opening. So by default, I am an old version of the so-called millennial. Yeah, old version. So I, I, was, I was born as the, uh, the early millennials who are, uh, I, I won't blame you if you find it hard to believe that I still belong in the group of uh, in that group of age, but since I'll be entering my 40s in the coming months, yes, 40, 40. But I'm sure we can all agree that the topic today is intriguing and very timely, actually. You see, more and more we see with the accelerated rise of uh, di digitalism, the advancing role of Generation Y and Z plays in shaping our world, our culture, our way of life, and even our policies. Uh, we could see that more and more. And it is most certain as members of these generations start to fill in more leadership roles in the future, uh, their actions, or if I may say, our actions become more and more important to understand, be it in education, in their aspiration, in economy, or even in governance. So therefore, I am delighted to have with me four speakers that fill a wide spectrum of concentration to discuss about this. Uh, first, we have Masbili Mamrasar, the special staff to the President of the Republic of Indonesia. Hello, Masbili. Hello, Mas Timothy. Hi, thank you for joining us today, Mas Billy. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So we also have Marahayu Saraswati, member of the Indonesian Parliament from 2014 to 2019 from the Gerindra Party. And she, uh, he is, she is now the CEO of PT Bima Sakti Bahari and also the chair of the Gerindra Youth, Tidar. Hi, Sara, how are you? Hi there, Tim. Good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. I always see you in a very political uh, event. So well, hopefully this is less political. So <laughs> oh, it's, I'm, I'm going to keep it political for you. <laughs> so thanks once again for joining us. It's good to see you again. And we have with us also joining today, Mariko Saito, Director of Gender Action Platform. Hi, Mariko. How are you? Hello, Timothy. Nice to be. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm pleased to be here. It's great to have you. You're in currently Japan, you're in Tokyo. Japan. All right. Yeah. In Tokyo. All right. Yeah. Beautiful city. Was supposed to go there last year. COVID Very happened. cold so, down. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope we could we, next year we could we could uh, yeah. start going to Japan again. Yeah. And also we have Tomoko Takada, Regional Strategic uh, Planning Director from Hakuhodo Institute of Life and Living ASEAN. Hi. Um, oh, name. Hi. Tomoko, uh, sorry, Moka. Yes. Moka Takada, yeah? All right. Yes. Sorry, I wrote that wrong. So, Moka, how are you? Thanks for joining Great. us. <laughs> Thank you so and much. You're not joining me. us from Japan, are you? Um, I'm from Bangkok, actually. And my institute is based on Bangkok, studying about the ASEAN. So, hopefully, I can talk okay. from those aspects. Yeah. We'd love to know the ASEAN perspective as well. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Now, uh, thank you for your time with us today. I think we have around 15 minutes. And also, I'd like to remind everyone that we have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to write them down starting from now. Uh, I'm sure you could use either the Q&A uh, button at the, at the bottom of your screen or put your questions in chat. Don't, don't forget to also mention your name. And also, if you come from an institution, please mention your institution or probably your university. And uh, who do you want the quest question to be addressed to? So you could start that from now. I'm going to start with my questions. First of all, um, just a little about each and every one of you. Uh, a, a lot of us already know probably most of the speakers here. Uh, we know this and probably don't know much about the other. Uh, if you would allow me, please, uh, just a little about the background of your works. Like what are you active in right now? Or maybe like some studies that, some updates about yourself. We might know you already, but probably there's some updates that we don't know about yet. So I'm, I'm gonna ask Masbili to start off. So what are you working on right now, uh, Masbili? All right, so before being appointed as the special staff of the president of Indonesia, I'm actually leading a non-for-profit in education and human development. Uh, we're touching the underprivileged uh, community in the Eastern Indonesia because of the inequality that we try to kind of bridge. And we believe that number one, education will be the bridge. And number two, the young people or young population uh, will, will then, because of the social mobility, due to education can make a change. So mm -hmm. that's my, you know, my, my professional things that I've been doing for years. Then I'm appointed by the president to help him. My focus still on the same, air, same um, area of, 
education, youth, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And uh, academic wise, currently I'm doing my study in human development and psychology in Harvard University. Uh, and my interest is researching on how can we uh, intervene, the be intervene the behavior, especially the young populations of the country by kind of ta tailoring the preference with the policy and political directions uh, of a country. All right, we can learn a lot from you uh, in our talks. So I I'm going uh, to Mariko. Would you tell us a little about what you're working on right now, Mariko? Um, yes, so hello, everybody. Um, um, as you can see, I'm not um, a generation Y or Z. I am, we can't see uh, you that, Mariko. It's not that, not that obvious, so. Can you see me? Oh, no. oh okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm in the middle, like I'm the strike zone of the Generation X. So I'd be talking from that perspective. I um been working uh for a very long time on promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. My career began um uh from the UN, uh, which I stayed with the United Nations Development Program for quite some time at mm -hmm. the gender team and also worked a little bit at Sri Lanka and then came back to Japan and since then had been working on so both issues um, at, on global issues as a consultant to the UN, um, sometimes the um, UNDP, UNITAR, um, UN Women, as well as working uh, as an NGO, um, uh, as director of our small NGO, which we do a lot of policy advocacy and research. Um, so that's my main um, area of expertise and which I hope I can share some in, you know, insights from that. Great, Thanks. thank you very much, Mariko. I'm moving on to Sarah. How about you, Sarah? A lot of updates from you, I'm sure. Well, uh, even though I was a member of parliament in uh, 2014, 2019, uh, but actually the reason why I got into politics in the first place is my calling to fight against human trafficking since 2009. Mm. Um, and I'm continuing that now, even though I'm no longer uh, in uh, practical politics or in parliament, uh, so I can focus more on that. Um, of course, you also mentioned I'm a CEO of a company which we focus on sustainable um, blue economy uh, since mm. uh, it's uh, very much to do with uh, products, uh, you know, marine products, um, because I'm also an activist for climate, uh, the climate crisis uh, here in Indonesia and an environmentalist. Um, but uh, my main thing is still for the advocacy for women and children here in Indonesia specifically and especially to do with human trafficking. Um, aside from that, still very much active in politics, as you've mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. and just got uh, uh, elected as the chairperson for the uh, youth organization um, yesterday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so still very much politically involved as well, but we need uh, women's voices in politics, especially young women's voices. So that's why I'm sticking it out. All okay, right. Thank you, Sarah. So when you say update, it's like super update, like something that just came up yesterday. Thanks for that. Uh, moving on to Mocha. Could you tell us a little about your work, Mocha? Yes. So I belong to a think tank, which is located in Bangkok, and mm -hmm. we are studying about the consumer trends, lifestyle, those kind of a new emerging trends among ASEAN people and more from the anthropological uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. And the last year's topic was about the Gen Z. I mean, this mm -hmm. year's a publication we have made is about the ASEAN Gen Z. So that's why I think I am here. <laughs> and we have found out many, many differences from the millennials, Gen X, and the Gen Z from Japan as well. So um, hopefully I can talk something about this today. You have a lot to talk about. <laughs> we probably have to give you a whole hour to just yeah. present the, the, your findings. So, uh, so it's pretty clear about everyone's uh, area focus. Uh, Maspili, uh, Mariko, uh, Sara, and also Moka. So, uh, focusing on Gen Y and Gen Z. You know, uh, as I said, a lot of us are part of the generation. But to be honest. Uh, I, I don't really understand my own generation, let alone <laughs> Generation Z. So uh, I'm sure a lot of studies could help us to understand that. And considering that those at very uh, leadership positions in the world right now, let it be political or, or economy or business-wise or other uh, social aspects, 
uh, most of them sitting there at the very top are not the Gen Y or Gen Z yet. So a lot of policies, a lot of decisions are still made based on the former understandings on how the world works and what people want and how people react to things, which might be a different thing with the generation Y and Z. So if you would just share your opinions on each respective fields, uh, everyone here, each speaker here in your respective fields, what have been your findings regarding Gen Y and Gen Z? Uh, if I may, I would like to start with Mariko. Yes, thank you, Timothy. Um, um, yes, uh, as uh, I'll be speaking from uh, the point of view from Japan because yes, we've please. been witnessing amazing, you know, changes driving, you know, being dried by the two generations. Um, as you know, Japan is a very sort of a, a well, a patriarchal um, country. And in terms of gender equality and women's empowerment, we have a very long way to go. Mm -hmm. You probably heard a lot of news from the Olympics and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so from that background, um, however, and I've been back, I've been away from Japan. I'm working um, at the UN for some time, but I've been back for uh, about um, 15 years now. So I've been seeing this real big shift uh, during this mm -hmm. time. And it's been led by the youth, definitely. Um, the recent, um, especially the youth, are now sort of, um, you know, really sort of trying to change the very sensitive areas uh, of policy and even the law. Uh, the, one of the biggest example of change is, is the um, change of the revision of the criminal law in Japan uh, mm -hmm. about the sex crime. Um, mm -hmm. And, the, and um, this was in 2017. And um, the Japanese um, uh, sex crime law hadn't been changed for 110 years. Wow. And in fact, um, before the revision, the penalty for rape had been lighter, lighter than robbery. And it's just that, you know, it's a, a very sort of a, a, what do you call it, a representation of how the law had been, you know, created by the decision makers who were men, um, and the women's boy voices had not been reflected at all. And so what mm -hmm. happened uh, during, for the course of about a couple of years up to running up to 2017 was that a group of young women, um, NGOs, activists, um, also support groups, women's victim support groups have gotten together. They really made a coalition and they did lots of campaigns through the social network. And that really moved through the, um, you know, the public opinions, as well as they really worked together with the different generations of experts and the policymakers and really advocating concretely as well and uh, the change was made that you know the definition was widened a little bit and the penalty mm. was a little bit heavier but things like this are happening the youth are like changing the there's a lot of media uh issues uh, gender issues on the media that we call it angel like you know it sort of fires up because a lot of the messages on the commercials are really like gender stereotype or mm. um, promotes inequality, et cetera. So there are a lot of like, you know, movements and um, uh, led by the youth uh, addressing these issues. So it's it's been, I think these past couple of years, especially um, maybe five years, but especially accelerating these past couple of years, um, we're mm. able to see the change happening. And they're actually influencing these really sensitive areas in politics and um, social issues. So we're really, really, um, you know, learning from that and also really happy to work with them too. That's interesting. Um, just a follow up question. What changed? I mean, the youth was always there. Right? Yeah. There's always going to be a youth, right? Mm -hmm. Just different people. Yeah. Um, the problem was always there. As you said, the, the law has never changed for hundreds of years, for a hundred years. But what changed? Why were the youth listened to this time? Why did right. the policymakers finally acknowledge the problem? Um, it's a really good question. It's actually a lot of sort of different comprehensive things happening at the same time. Um, social media is a big drive, I think. Mm. Um, education also has changed. Um, I personally, coming from a, a UN background, I see the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, as a very strategic entry point for our um, Japanese youth to enter and really be aware of global issues. Because before the, it was MDGs and Japan was a donor country supporting you know, mm -hmm. recipient countries. So there, it was never our problem, but with the SDGs, all of a sudden, and the youth receiving education in their schools about the SDGs are mm -hmm. opening up and they get to more information, not just from the bigger media, but through social network, they can access to all different kinds of expert knowledge, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that's really driving the change, I think. 
So there you go. One tool that wasn't available before. Exactly. That was social media. It's, it's very was... huge in terms of um, um, because the media had been very, um, the information had been quite sort of closed before. Mm -hmm. The large mm -hmm. media had been really sort of dominant in Japan. Whereas now with the social network and there are lots of information going um, on. All right. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Mariko. That was eye opening. Uh, let me move on to Masbili. Masbili, you are also one of the um, young Indonesians uh, that that was chosen to uh, help the president here. So, uh, of course, you play a role. And uh, on the other hand, you also see the role that your generation plays or also the Gen Z plays. So what would, uh, in, you, in your area uh, of work, what have been your findings uh, about the Generation Y and the Generation Z? Um, there are a couple of misunderstanding uh, or misperceptions about the Generation um, uh, Y and Z that most people would think politically these people are liberals, like, you know, agree on climate change, mm. uh, be kind of like support of the, any kind of sexual orientations, are open-minded and everything, mm. but in fact, <laughs> The latest research shows that these generations are more polarized than ever before, and it's happening in all around the world. For instance, in the United States of America, between the left and the right, or democratic versus republics, like consists of both sides of generation Y and Z. And I think that's also happening in Indonesia with the previous elections of like people are more to the left and right, and both sides have this kind of people who are grouped and polarized. Um, and the reasons of that uh, is related with the second um, point that I want to make about inequality. It's like um, the Generation Y and Z uh, are grouped into like the upper and middle class income, which is the minority, who, uh, who are more materialistic, thinking about finance uh, and everything, and the remaining of the populations uh, in the lower and mid, mid, uh, middle class income are, you know, struggling really hard to get so, uh, upward in the social mobility. And, be, and this group of youth are the majority. It's like if you're looking at the numbers of Indonesia, mm -hmm. um, only 8% of the populations so of these young people can access tertiary education in comparison to more than 90% drop out in junior high school and senior high school. So those people uh, in this kind of, you know, bottom of pyramid is full of anger because mm -hmm. they feel that we're not just more than numbers for yeah. political yeah. reasons, for markets, for, you know, anything. We, we're not really hurt. So because of that reason number two, which is inequality, the number three, this group of people are really distant from the government and governance, not from politics, from the government, governance and governments. What I mean by the government, government, governments and governance is that um, some people think that involved in politics means that, you know, oppose opposition, protesting via social media, tweet and everything. But actually the government desperately needs the help of these young people to be the partners to do the development. Yeah. If we keep the distance, then we cannot be helping our government to kind of accelerate the progress. Um, and lastly is the mental health issues, mm. uh, which is actually closely related with my research. Uh, the latest research shows that more than 50% of the young people in the United States are having the MDD or major depression disorder. And it's because of the social media. And it, because of that reason number four, the people, that's uh, number five, the people in the status quo who is in the power, who kind of possess the money, the wealth, keep the status quo of mm. being in that position because the young people are so distant from that governance and governments full of anger, you know, feel apathetic about uh, the current running political systems, everything. So what I'm doing with the president right now in most of our discussions is finding strategy, strat strategies on how to rightly involve these young people to not only be heard uh, and include their opinions in the policy making, but also involving them in doing the developments like real development. And my task so far has been in the outer provinces of Indonesia in which the inequality 
is I think the worst. Mm -hmm. So from your studies, I don't know if, if, if it goes that far, but what will be the outcome if these issues are not addressed uh, promptly, like when, when they distance themselves from the government, when that causes a, a, a detachment from that, um, and also how it affects them uh, internally, uh, individually, uh, psychologically. So what would be the outcome if this is not addressed? And, and who, who would address it when, as you said, they're detached, I mean, they, they feel a distant with the government. So I think, don't forget that Indonesia will be facing the uh, bonus, uh, the de demographic yeah. bonus in 2030, 2045, in which 80 to 90% of the populations will be at the age of, at the productive age. And yeah. Generation Y and Z will be the, the, the most of the populations uh, as in the numbers of demographics. So mm. this is very dangerous. If they're not involved with the distance, you know, keep being distance, then, who is going to be making our country to be a developed country, you know, because we really hurt for their involvement in it. Mm. Um, the second risk I would see is that the smoothness of the government to be running, if the country is full of the population to deal with anger. Mm. Instead, if we're successfully bridging that starting from now, then our country will be so powerful when we face our, bon our demographic bonus. And I think there's a lot of good examples of other countries like South Korea, uh, which has been you know, involving, involving the, the, the young people, investing a lot in the young people to kind of you know, experience, to benefit uh, with their power, the strength, like what's, uh, what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thanks uh, really for sharing your thoughts. Now, uh, moving on to uh, Mocha, I'd like to know uh, your insights about what you've uh, learned from, from, from your research, especially when we see a huge cultural explosion within the youth right now, how borders are crossed so easily yes. in digitalism and how uh, a nation could affect another nation culturally and so on. So what have been your findings? Yes. So based on our survey, so we have done different quantitative and qualitative survey to the ASEAN users alongside with millennials. And the key finding, which was interesting was when, so I think millennials were often said to be me generation, more about the um, self-centers caring about themselves quite uh, taking themselves quite important, which is an amazing thing, I think. And I am millennial I, I, I would myself, really love to so. beg to differ, actually, but I yes. can't really say <laughs> that. So, <laughs> And when it comes more about the generation that in ASEAN, they're mm -hmm. kind of a bit nice balance of Gen X and Gen Y, which is Gen X is more about the sacrificing themselves to protect their families or building a, a country or building societies, that kind of people. And Gen Y, more about the taking, taking care of themselves, that kind of a generation. Then um, Gen Z is very harmonious generation we named. So mm -hmm. they are quite taking nice balance of contributing to society and contributing or having, um, treasuring themselves. So they mm -hmm. try to make happy society or happy surrounding alongside with happy me. So mm -hmm. try to find a nice perfect balance of like happiness within themselves and outer world. So that was quite important uh, point. So I think they understand the pain of others and the pain of themselves as well. So that is why I think they are passionate about changing the world in a better place than um, anything before and quite serious about the making a changes in society and they're seeking a solution to the different uh, problem happening in societies. So I think, again, as Mariko-san has mentioned, SNS is helping um, Gen Z not only advocating the issues, but also learning about the issues as well. They are um, quite easy access to understanding different uh, issues and mm. also addressing. So that was what I found it out in the survey. That, that sounds like they have the hardest job. I mean, Gen yes. X was thinking about uh, the nation, the bigger picture, well, yes. Gen Y, I think about myself. So that's probably uh, the easiest job here <laughs> compared to the all generations there. But even that is hard enough. We know how hard it is, it is to satisfy ourselves as well. 
So does that create pressure to Generation Z or when they have to create that harmony between their own happiness and trying to create an impact uh, in the world uh, and an impact that that is felt by other people and has a positive effect? I, I, I would think that that's a big pressure. It's going to be a big pressure. It sounds like it is. But interestingly, so asking them about how they've grown up Many of the uh, Gen Z said that they were grown up in very casual, happy environment. In the same time, they learn about to have a critical mind. So think by themselves, understand the world issue and think. So that was mm. quite interesting part. And, but also they were taught to learn about the very traditional ASEAN value, as values as well. So mm. you know, only being critical doesn't allow you to survive in the Asian world I think so uh, that was quite interesting so I think they are equipped equipped to mm. be able to uh, wish and create those harmonious world so instead of feeling pressured I think they were well equipped by the either uh, millennial or gen x parents so that is my point of view All right, thanks, Mocha. Now, moving on to Sarah, uh, one reason I kept you last because you live in so many worlds. You're a mother, you're a business person, you are a politician, an activist. So I would like to know uh, your thoughts on, on what has, has been your observation in these different parts of your own world. Oh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. <laughs> I was hoping to gotta go first because now well, I'm getting all these ideas from Marikos well, and Mokasad and Billy, you know. But okay, well, first of all, uh, you know, obviously, as a first, I'll, I'll I'll go into something that they haven't talked about before, mm -hmm. which is you know politics. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Billy also mentioned this actually uh, that it's not that they're apathetical because there's a lot of assumption. You know, and the media sometimes uh, portrays how the young generations are very apathetic towards the political issues and what's going on politically. And I don't think that's true because, uh, you know, from my experience, for example, TikTok, okay, um, mm. it's, it's interesting how when I post uh, something that's actually political, I get more views than when I'm posting something that isn't political. Really? So there is a high interest. Yeah, I mean, you know, surprise. Um, <laughs> there's a high interest even by the youths, and we see this as, you know, you're in the media, you know, uh, mm. when, when it, we're talking about political issues, whatever it is, that it's always deemed as a hot issue. So I think mm. that there is a disconnect between the reality and, and, and what's actually being said. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's apathy, but it's a distrust and, and disappointment mm. because the youths, you know, whether it's generation Y or it's, uh, sorry, generation uh, Z or Y, um, we're, we're, we're going through a transition or, well, for us, Tim, we're, we've mm. gone through that transition, but so. uh, since we're, we're in the upper ends, um, yeah. but especially for the generation Z, they're going through that transition where they've gone, they're just coming out of college or they're still in college. They have their idealism um, of what they've been taught as what is right. Mm -hmm. And then they're faced with the reality that, oh my goodness. And it's not, it's not that the, the reality is a sad place. It's just that they are faced with other people who do not have the same opinions as they do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, 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 it's, and it's trying to connect between their idealism with other people's. And please remember, Indonesia is a 270 million people you know, population, population country. Yeah. You are always going to find people from different backgrounds with different ideologies and different idealisms. Even when I was in parliament, you know, I was only one out of 560, you know, now it's 575. Mm. Um, you're always going, you're always bound to be meeting with people who come from completely different backgrounds, mm. who grew up in different cultures. Indonesia has hundreds of ethnicities, hundreds of dialects. There's always going to be differences. Yeah. So, so I think it's, it's marrying that. And, and again, to, to, to put, um, to, Re re reiterate what uh, Billy was saying. We, you know, we don't have to wait until 2030, Billy. The, the, the millennials and the Gen Z are already the majority in Indonesia. We are, mm. there's 
53% of us. The, the productive age is 70.72% based on last year's, okay? So 2020's uh, de demographic, 70, 70 72 demographic, 70.72 for uh, the, the productive age and 53% for millennials and Gen Z alone. So we are already the majority. Now, however, so that, that brings up very interesting questions to do with politics because obviously politics, it's all about votes, right? It's, yeah. it's how to get, so when you know that, oh my goodness, 53% of the votes that we need to get are from the Gen Z and millennials. Now the leaders that are from the baby boomers, the generation before mm -hmm. us, they're really asking, what are you all thinking? You know, and, mm -hmm. and now there's surveys coming up that, that shows that the youths are interested in the climate change issue, you know, environmental issues. It's only second to corruption. We, ha we still have issues with corruption. So that's like number one. Number two happens to be climate change. And then, but aside from that, uh, you know, Mariko san, we can definitely talk about this all day until tomorrow because I'm also an activist for uh, women and children's rights. And we are at the moment still in the heights of discussion and fighting for the sexual abuse eradication bill. Yeah. Um, and you know this, Tim, that mm. is a very controversial and highly debated yeah. bill because, again, we are facing the 270 million that's being represented by the 575 representatives who come from different ideologies and some, and here's the thing, Indonesia does not have a separation between state and religion. This mm. is the difference, the main difference uh, between us and other countries. Other countries, you cannot put it in. Here, the 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 fundamentalists the far rights right are are fighting to to ensure that their views are being included yeah. in our laws and that is a huge debate so we are seeing more of the youths uh, you know voicing out their concerns they they but but and i i i'm also reiterating what billy said um there's a huge disconnect there's a huge social gap, social disparity um, that needs to be addressed. And a lot of that is to do with education as well. Uh, you know, so um, Billy and I, we, we talk a lot about this so often because it's, you know, it, it, it shows when we, like, for example, this year, I know mm. from the delegates um, of Indonesia that are representing us in the Y20 and, you know, Japan is also there, right? And, and so, there, it was really funny this year in Italy because uh, Y20 this year was in Italy. We're, we're, we're the presidency for next year. Um, mm. When they're talking about sustainability, when they're talking about climate, the developed countries, there was one delegate apparently who was already voicing out concerns about space junk. Whereas in Indonesia, <laughs> we're still talking about clean water. <laughs> you know, It's like we're still talking that. about... Yeah, yeah access to clean water we're still talking about access to you know health facilities yeah. and you know basic human rights and all of that and 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 the waste management system they're already talking about you know in other space countries junk. they're already talking about space junk so you you know so there's this huge disparity and and then the last thing i will mention is also about urbanization um you mm -hmm. know it's been going on for years we all know that However, there is, you know, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with mm -hmm. the digitalization that's happening. We are seeing now a lot more movement for, from the youths that are in their villages. You know, we see the, we call it the Patani millennial. These are the millennial farmers, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to show, hey, farming can be cool, right? Mm -hmm. And which is something we need because it's like, hello, we have a huge population but we have people who are still starving, right? So, exactly. so you know, so, so I'm this, you know, I've been saying all the negatives and all that, but uh, <laughs> the last thing, right? Light at the end of the tunnel. There, there is a plus with the digitalization. There is a plus with the social media where the youth that before did not have access to voice, to, yeah. to you know, to basically voice out their concerns and, and their yeah. interests have that now as their platform. And as long as they're creative, which the youths are, especially Indonesian youths, mm -hmm. um, they should be able to uh, basically access that. And, and we should be able to support them in order to find more equality and, and to lessen that gap. So one thing, uh, Sarah, you were talking about 
uh, how politicians look into what the youth want, especially Generation Y and Z. Does that mean that they will be more listened to? Their, their voices will be heard by well, politicians in the future? Let's or, hope so. You or, know how or just, <laughs> or just to extent where we could get their voices or what, what would you say about that? You, well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm among the youth as, you know, but you know, earlier mentioned, right? There's more mm. youth politicians and I'm blessed to have been given the trust uh, and the mandate, not just as the chairperson for the youth organization wing of my party, but also as actually vice or deputy chair of my of the party, actually. Mm. So, and you know, Tim, how outspoken I am. So I'll definitely make sure my voice <laughs> is heard. <laughs> and 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 so um, I think we need more of that. I think I think mm. the the parties uh, across all the parties, especially those that are in parliament. Mm -hmm. need to show a, an, a real effort, uh, not just for the sake of getting votes, but a real effort yeah. to listen to what the constituents and that's us, right? And, and, and I think it's important for, you know, Billy, myself, and a lot of us youths in Indonesia that have platforms mm -hmm. to push for the youth to, hey, you need to speak out. You need to speak up. And, and, and we've had this issue, Tim, where we have the silent majority, right? And yeah. it seems that the, those that are, the, it, there's a lot of influencers that are really, and it's not just about social gap. We're also talking about uh, ideological gap. Uh, mm. We have a lot more uh, influence in the uh, fundamentalist and I dare I say even radicalist uh, views that have entered Indonesia or have been around, but they've just been silent. And it, within the last 10 years, they've been very loud and very mm -hmm. outspoken mm -hmm. and making themselves known. And we need to show that the moderates and those, the nationalists are still here. And okay. so the silent majority need to not remain silent, but to be more outspoken. Okay. I see you're still very passionate with politics. It's in your voice. We could hear that uh, very loudly. So it's great to know it's that. It's not about politics. It's about injustice. <laughs> <laughs> Through politics, I guess uh, that's one way. So thanks a lot, uh, Sarah. Thank so, you. So uh, I'm moving on. Uh, let's talk about the world of Gen Y and Gen Z. So the world that we're living in today, uh, most particularly the effects of digitalism and social media. It's not about just giving everyone a voice uh, where social media steps in, but it's about the technology that, that, that is available for them now. We see a lot of technology probably in the form of apps or even gadgets coming out, which kind of like decentralizes control and decentralizes uh, uh, broadcasting, decentralizes so many things, which gives everyone a chance to either you know a be someone to be heard to create to start something and it, it kind of gives everyone a, 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 a well relatively uh similar you know uh level playing field i i say rather because it's not it's not really in general but you we see that how digitalism really affects and how digitalism really helps us uh to pop out or to just recognize somebody who probably didn't have a chance in the in a more centralized world, centralized media, centralized uh, uh, technology. So what is your comment on that? I'd like to know everyone's comment on this. So I'd like to go to Mocha first before I move on. So I'm just shifting everyone here. So you might have a long wait, you might have a short wait here, uh, but I'd like to know everyone. So how has been the effect of this, Mocha? Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question once again? Sorry. Yeah, so the effects, so the easy question would be the effects of digitalism and social media and how mm -hmm. this shaped the generation Y and Z. Yes. Um, again, so as I mentioned, um, so it, it becomes a very uh, nice gateway to understand the world issues in a very comprehensive and very um, heartfelt way, may I say, mm -hmm. because I think there is different media, different um, media that is targeting Generation uh, Y and Z to understand the issues visually with the short videos and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something uh, very helping uh, Gen Z. And another uh, way of helping Gen Z is 
that the the SNS and those kind of uh, media provides a place for them to express and show their opinion. So they learn and express in one places. I think that is the mm. value of digitalization and the value of the SNS for their mm. um, activities. So, it, but it doesn't stop at expression, does it? Like the, the usage, uh, Gen Z usage of social media, it doesn't stop at, at, at expressing themselves, at showing or showcasing their talents, but it also like, and how they consume and how yes. uh, products also reach them and so on. Mm-hmm. So is this the future? Is this what we're going to see or, or yes. like the death of what, what we know marketing has been? <laughs> but I think I believe that the Gen Z will continue expressing um, their opinion. And I think that, I think it's the same with Japan and the ASEAN, but the, having the political opinion and being opinionated is getting, I don't want to say fashionable, but it's, it's becoming something that is cool to have mm. their own mind and have their opinion. So I think this is something very um, good influences that SNS may also. Mm-hmm. All right, thank you, Mokasan. Uh, I'll move to Mariko-san. Uh, what is your opinion on this, the effects of digitalism and social media and how it has shaped uh, the generation? Right. Um, thank you. And, and you also sort of, you also in, the, in, the, in your first phase of your question mentioned about, mentioned about the globalization. So mm-hmm. I, I, I want to share with you uh, sort of a, a trend that I see in Japan is that, and I think in terms of um, the top leadership ro- sort of seg- uh, segment, in, mm-hmm. in of these generation Y and Z, um, who come from a wealthier family, who are you know have the opportunity to access, have lots of resource access to resources, opportunities, I think had really these SNS digitalization had really opened up their sort of the spectrum of their sort of worldview and how they access to that global issues and really sort of work on it as well. I mean, I'm sure Sasan and our close, you know, they, they, you guys know about the top sort of the leaders of the Y7 or the Y20s from Japan, mm-hmm. the delegates. I mean, I've seen them, you know, speak at events and, and their, you know, opinions and, and how they advocate to the global leaders. And they're like really brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is, they're far sort of advanced from, for example, our generation at that age. So I think that's one trend, but then at the same time, um, sort of the rest of the generation, sort of that group um, who do not have that opportunity um, are said to be more inward looking in Japan. Mm. And, and so, and they, and sometimes I think they have more access thanks to the digitalization, like pop culture or, you know, so that kind of like games, et cetera, and sort of that, that's how they access the world or outside of Japan. Um, but I don't think they go into politics all that much, mm. but at the same time, when but then I, I was really interested by the comments made by you know Billy and Sarah about that that frustration, uh, and 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 the the younger generation. I mean, Japan has I mean our generation experienced sort of a economic growth, you know, and 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 the life is going to be better. But then the generation below us were or feel are you know stuck in the economy that yeah. had declined and is never sort of uplifting, and they don't. The numbers might say, the figures, the economic statistics might say that we're improving, but they just don't feel it, right? Mm. And they were brought up in that sort of all through their lives, they were brought up under that situation. And they look at the politics, they look at outsider, you know, some are really angry about these fortunate people and, and their own lives com- making that comparison. So there's a lot of sort of, a, sort of you know, verbal um, internet attacks, et cetera, right. um, that goes sort of really extreme as well, um, you know, so it's sort of, I think there's sort of like a divide um, in Japan of how you make use of the digital um, um, tools. Oh, interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Mariko-san. Uh, Sara, what would you say on, on this? Because uh, I'm sure you've, you've been there, you're still in the digital media, and you've seen how it has shaped our culture and just the way we interact. Yeah. You know, it's. We, we, I also mentioned digitalization as as one of those you know positives, and 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 we're seeing this. But I, there was an interesting question that I was trying to answer in the chat as well. Uh, someone asked um, about how can we make the youth care more about humanitarian issues, mm-hmm. which is really interesting because, um, well, at least in my opinion, I think 
it's not necessarily they don't they don't care because I think a lot of them do care. You know, it's mm-hmm. the same thing with politics. They do care. They 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 voice out a lot, and we you know we have what we call them netizens, right? Yeah. So it's it's basically those who are the followers, those who comment on you know your posts and everything. So we do have a lot of interactions with the youths that are using social media, yeah. right? And and it gives them access to the politicians gives them access straight to the governors to the regents and and you know the more uh those the, the governors and the regents and the you know the deputies those that are more popular are usually are those who interact directly mm-hmm. with their constituents and with the youth through social media mm-hmm. but but here's the thing uh you know with with so it's not that they don't care but i think we're seeing a lot of as we're sh- as we've shifted from the baby boomers and i think i felt this you know the generation y the millennials we were the transition you know i remember we were just learning how to type for the computer yeah. in like fifth or sixth grade <laughs> now my son who's six years old in first grade is already learning coding for goodness sake right <laughs> like, yeah, I, you know so that's a huge that's you know the, yeah. he's generation alpha but what i'm saying is with the generation y with the transition with what comes with the digitalization comes also instant gratification um there's almost like uh less value on working hard because they stress mm. so much on working smart mm. that then they take it for granted and it's it's affecting how they view humanitarian issues whether mm. it's social issues where the weather is to do with domestic abuse or it's to do with climate change they care but mm. do they do they have the energy to get out of bed and do something about it cuz okay. it's so easy for them to kind of just i'll do something by you know just typing and clicking away on my phone and mm. posting something about it um mm. and then that's it so so i think it's more of that issue it's it's about it's about hey like you do actually need to get up uh, and and mm. do something and and find work and um, or create jobs you know it's it's we need more youths to create more jobs because they're the majority they're the productive they're creative they're the ones who understand the gi- mm. the digital world more than the older generation they're the ones who can adapt with this pandemic we've seen how mm. indonesia can actually survive better i mean i was quite yeah. pessimistic in the beginning <laughs> now i'm optimistic because i'm like wow a lot of my friends it, 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 even when they lost their jobs they were okay because straight away they managed to switch to something else and yep. you know start selling online right tim I, yep. you know i'm pretty sure you got all those yeah. messages hey do you want to buy my cakes you know oh, especially, <laughs> so, especially during christmas time so <laughs> especially now i've got hampers for you to buy yeah. right but very very interesting like like as you said it's it's about realizing that this is also at least for now it's a tool and don't stay there but use it as it is which is the tool right so you still it's have to tool. do a lot that's so important on that so so moving on to billy now i i just like to ask a question i add to that question billy it's still about uh digitalism and social media but also about technology itself how it can empower uh so many people and individuals and we've seen that uh and how could we use how could the gen y and gen z use the technology as well to empower their generation to empower the nation to empower the world um before touching to that question i think uh a bit you know kind of like um what is it elaborate on but mm-hmm. sarah's answers before that is what i meant by apathetic wasn't the apathetic uh, politically apathetic mm. but they're very vocally politics and i also am a follower of but sarah in tiktok and instagram and you know kept commenting looking at how people interacted and kind of like driven especially on the religious political religious issues it is not about apathetic towards politics they're very vocally politics but distant with the government willingness to be partner with the government to solve the issues instead of like being just the opposition especially on the digital era in which you using the digital and social media to oppose 
instead of looking for solutions and partner with the government to, to deal with those issues. So just mm -hmm. a bit clarifications on that uh, uh, point. Mm -hmm. About the technology and digital, however, a couple of studies in developing countries show that it actually increasing the inequality between different groups of demographics of amongst young people. In Java Island, it is more than 60% who have access to internet. But if you go to the Eastern part of the country, it's only around three to 5% of the internet penetrations. That means a lot of young people in the outer provinces still have no internet access. And thankfully to President Joko Widodo last year, this year, I mean, because I was in the meeting, he instructed to do the, the digital the transformation, the digital national digital transformation in which he ordered to increase the budget for increasing the digital infrastructure as, uh, as well as the, um, the human capacity building for that to reduce the inequality. I traveled to 22 different provinces in the previous you know, years uh, on, on, on my assignment special task at the president. When we're talking about education, for instance, and if you ask Indonesian, who is the hero of education in the education sector, they're most likely to just mention one startup with one name, you know, oh, it's maybe one guru, something like that. Mm. But actually, when I travel to those 22 provinces, there are heroes, local heroes to fight for education out there who have no access to internet, who doesn't have Instagram account, who doesn't have Twitter, who doesn't post on Facebook, by that, but they do real things on the ground to help this country in the education sector. Talking about the Pani Millennial, because Masara mentioned about it, if we're asking them, do you know anyone or anything in relations with agriculture, young people with agriculture, maybe people will say Tani Hub. But actually there are thousands of young people of Indonesia out there who fight for agriculture, who fight to give the farmers undiscovered rights, you know, income, but they have no access to internet. They have no digital access and everything. So I think in a way, the digital and technology could increase the inequality for those who have access to internet and digital, or even have money to pay advert for publicizing yourself in the national mm. TV will be known, whereas mm -hmm. those other young people will not be known. So this is, you know, a note that digital could, but also in, uh, could help, but also actually will be increasing the inequality if we do not manage it. However, if you're asking my personal opinion, I am very optimistic that digital and technology will be the solution to reduce the inequality. If we, number one, as what President Jokowi is doing right now, increasing the digital infrastructure. Number two, provide education and training for more young people to have access to digital and technology and, and be able to do it. And number three, um, provide uh, access because sometimes you have internet, you have technology, but you have no money to buy pulsa or to buy credits, you know, so how to increase the access for them financially to then utilize it really well, really well. Um, lastly, my point about the downside of dig digital, and I think Mocha has touched a little bit about it, that is health, mental health issues. Um, as an educator, when I talk to my you know, students, especially from Generation Z, they keep looking at this mobile phone, Instagram, and they start comparing their lives to the other you know, lives. It's like, you know, uh, people in Nusa Tenggara Timur, for instance, of, of the eastern provinces of Indonesia, looking at how fancy the lives of youth in Jakarta. Um, it's like, oh, they go to malls. You know, you know, just recently something happening in the Twitter, like very viral about a Papuan who wanted yeah. to watch Spider-Man. And because he doesn't have cinema and he looked at the Instagram of people in Jakarta watch uh, Spider-Man, he bought a ticket 
an airplane ticket just to go to Jakarta to watch the Spider-Man. I think the Sony pictures from the United States kind of give comments that, oh, we're going to give you a presence because of your, you know, spirit, stuff like that. But but I think it's a satiric in a way that this increasing the mentality of like, you know, the, the, uh, depression, uh, I was talking about depression and then jealousy and jealousy will create anger. And yeah. if it is combined with the political and political uh, politics view of like, oh, the government is, is so unfair. Mm -hmm. It's so unfair and, and, and stuff like that. It will be increasing the, the anger. Uh, and it is something that you see what's happening, you know, recently if you don't, if you don't manage it. So as an educator, the implication is that how can we also have a knowledge to teach, to train, and to direct our students, our young people to use the technology well. Yeah. So yeah. that it's not going to be, you know, providing negative impact, uh, whatever that I was talking about. Agreed. Thank you, Billy, for that. So before I, I give out my last question, I guess we'll just go to Q&A because I see I have questions here uh, from the audience. So I'm just going straight to question number one. Um, this is to Billy. So this comes from Yoshina from UMKM Papua. As a youth from the eastern part of Indonesia, how do you speak up on human development in Papua towards the digital era? What should the youth be equipped with to be able to compete with the rest of the world? Billy. I was just talking about how low is the internet penetration. And that's what I've been talking in a lot of national meetings uh, in the palace with the president, with the minist ministry, with the parliament members. I was always raising the inequality of internet access, not just for the youth in the Eastern Indonesia, but including Western Indonesia, like the outer provinces. A lot of young people, they do not have access to digital. They do not have, have access to technology. And when I spoke with the president and he responded positive, positively, he was making two meetings, the national meetings, in which he gave order to the ministry uh, and ministries, relevant ministries, to increase the budget for uh, digital infrastructure and def development. And I think we see the progress. Uh, we need to kind of keep doing it, accelerating it. And I think that is a blessing in disguise uh, of the pandemic COVID-19 that it forces us to kind of, you know, adapt and it forces the country to then increase it, you know, increase the accessibility. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, I also talk to private sectors to uh, kind of partner with the territory education in the Eastern Indonesia provinces to increase the digital infrastructure. So just recently, I, uh, I, I was successfully kind of, you know, uh, drag one of the biggest tech company uh, in Jakarta to partner with Polytechnic Negeri Fakfak to equip that university in the Eastern Indonesia with the digital um, technology to provide access for the youth there. But I think we need to work together. I think about Sarah and I are talking about a couple of strategies that we're going to you know, work together. I'm, I'm going to help her, of course, with the organization that she's kind of co-chairing to increase the access for youth in Eastern Indonesia as well for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for sharing that. Uh, moving on to the second question. This is from Amy from APU University in Malaysia. Do you think social media influencers can in some way help with the lack of awareness of social and environmental issues? So uh, just from a, a more popular aspect or um, uh, we'd like to know how social media influencers have an effect to the youth, I I'd probably go to Mokasan first. Yes. So about that question, that is a very good question. So um, before this survey of Gen Z, we have done another survey on the year 2020, which was named we call Conscious ASEANs. And in that survey, we tried to survey those who were quite passionate about the uh, different social and environmental problems. And we interviewed different consumers on how they understand about the environmental or social issues and how they react. And the social influencers' influence was quite huge, we say. Mm. Everyone mentioned about some influencers. And starting from environment to social, there were different influencers across the ASEAN. And they have been very um, active on 
get creating the awareness and actually telling people how to act as well. So it was quite interesting to see because in Japan we see we are quite seeing those social influencers who were very um vocal about the social problems, but it's it's quite new. But mm. two years ago, that the survey we have done it two years ago, but the at that time in Asian it was quite um active and they were quite um contributing on those issues. So I think um that was another good point about their uh presence, I think. All right, thank you, um uh, uh maybe uh Sarah if you would like to add or Mariko san if you would like to add. No, okay. All so, good. Um uh, yeah. All right, Mariko san would you like to add um, to this? Yeah, issue? just to add to Moko san. Um Yes, definitely. Um, um, I think the influencers, like Mokosan said, in Japan, for the influencers are often, you know, like actresses or singers or, you know, a lot of them. Um, to actually mention anything political, it was a taboo uh, mm. for some time um, because of there are a lot of sort of, you know, uh, the sponsors issue, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very sensitive. But I think recently they've been very voice about it so even the recent um election that we just had um for the lower house uh, there were a lot of sort of calling out for let's go to the election to the younger people and that had i think influenced some of the the movements and so some of the social issues are being taken up um, um mm -hmm. thanks to these influencers i think all right thank you uh Mariko. and also i guess in politics we see that as well here in indonesia i mean sarah you're you're you know that how when singers or, or artists, actors, you know, sound like, like give a political opinion, they always get comments and, hey, you're, you're a singer, just sing. You know, you don't, you're, as, as if they're not entitled to a political uh, opinion. So I guess we see that here uh, as well in, in Indonesia, I guess. So, uh, but I, I want to move on to the next question because it's still kind of related, actually. This comes from Ulandari uh, from the Bangkulu Youth Forum. Are Generation Y and Z actually concerned about environmental issues and how should we ensure their participation? Now, this was also a, a point that you were talking about, Sara. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, to link with the influencers question, Mm -hmm. Here in Indonesia, it's a huge, it's a business. It is a business. I mean, to have an endorser, to have someone, mm. there are people who only have like five, you know, like basically there are rates. Like if it's, if you have 5,000 followers, how much is it to post? Uh, if you mm -hmm. have 10,000 followers, how much is it to post? It's a huge business. There are management uh, agencies, like not even real agencies, but management agencies that manage these influencers. You know, so if you want someone with more than ten thousand followers or per post, it's this many rupiah. You know, and so so it's a huge business. It's no, it, it is no longer a question for us because uh, there are certain um, accounts. Um, you know, whether it's Instagram, Twitter or whatever. And and that's why, you know, some hello, <laughs> Ronaldo is being paid like millions of dollars per post. OK, yeah. it's not even funny. So it's, it is a business here in Indonesia, especially because we have such a huge consumer um, you know, uh, driven, uh, you know, businesses and uh, the com consumerism is huge. And when it comes to, you know, politics, Tim, unfortunately, it, you know, then people start questioning, are you actually doing it because you really believe in it? Yeah. Or are you doing it just because you're paid for it? Yeah. Uh, and then there's all because it is a business. And then there's also the issue where these are, again, singers, actors, who have, not all of them are, you know, really highly educated in the political issues, but because their friends are pro this, <laughs> they all go there, you know, without really understanding what the issues that are being debated mm -hmm. about, you know, so, um, so we have that, we have that, that issue as well. And, and, and on that question by uh, Wulandari, uh, mm. I, I, I actually mentioned this earlier, but I'll, I'll mention it again. Uh, one of the survey, um, uh, Lembaga Survey, right? One of our, um, uh, yeah, I guess, Surveyor, I guess yeah. it's a it's survey true. companies, mm. like, you know, mm. um, they, they do surveys. Um, Indicator, they actually uh, came up, we came out, uh, they released a survey with like 4,000 youths or something, especially the Generation Z. 
Um, and this, this is why I was able to say that after corruption, the youths are interested in or concerned about uh, environmental issues. It actually came from there. The, the, the sample it was bigger than for you know the presidential election. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, was, it was so big that the sample was that big. Yeah. And there were that many youths that were interested in answering uh, that particular survey. And mm -hmm. it was interesting and it came in, in as a second. So I do believe from that it is, it is true that the youths are one, it's thank God they're aware of the issue. Number two, they're not only aware, but they do care. But if you if the question becomes, then how do we get them to to do exactly. something about it, right? Yeah. Because again, you can care about it, but what are you going to do about it? Are you are you willing to not use, uh, you know, um, fossil Certain fuel? Products. Are you are you going to be voicing out that you want, uh, you know, electrical cars or you want uh, public transportation to be installed in your city mm -hmm. are you going to work towards a biogas or you mm. know sustainable energy for your house like how far are you willing to go yeah, for yeah. those things that that would that should be the question it's not that they don't care they do care they very much care but they don't know how because mm -hmm. again a lot of the policies that are in place in Indonesia, even though the government and sorry, Billy, but I have to say this, even though the government are, you know, giving up the narration that um, that they care and they are, were pushing towards, uh, you know, 20, was it 2050 this time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, right, 2050 and it was like 2060 during COP26 for, you know, completely carbon neutral or something like that. Um, but the policies are very much far from it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. for us to install solar panels or even just for investors to come in and build solar panel, um, you know, factories, it's not worth it because it, the, 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 what's being paid by it's the awesome, government yeah. mm. to subsidize it is not equal to how much they actually need to spend. There's no profit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right now for that. Mm -hmm. So, so again, it's, 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 it, that's where then I said the disappointment comes in, the frustration comes in because okay. there's that gap. So that's the big picture, you know, with, with, with that, drive um, to to you know better the environment and we need policies that helps that as well uh, businesses you need probably tax incentives uh, to do that as well so it's a, it's a huge movement uh, we can't really put it on any generation uh, uh, just that generation alone so moving on next question is for billy i'm just going to ask this question from alma university of al-azhar of indonesia uh, with the ease of information provided by the internet does it affect the cultural identity of generations y and z and does it change their views on local cultural roots billy um that's a very good question and i was wondering about what's happening because of the digital app my assumption was that people are going to be very Americanized, very mass westernized because people looking at the American reality shows like very connected, very homogenized because of the digital. However, my observation is that youth are then become very polarized because of the digital and, and information preference that they got from the digital. If you notice that we have algorithm uh, in which we're only connected to the source of information of our preference. And that is the reason why people are very polarized. For instance, in the United States, youth or millennials who are Republican and live in the Republican community will only get information from the Republican circle that is very traditional, Christian, white, agriculture, American culture based on information. And that makes them become more and more traditional, more and more conservative. On the other hand, the youth from Democratic who is liberal, open-minded, talking about climate change, talking about LGBTQ rights and everything, are become very strongly opinionated about that because algorithm in the social media provide them with information and the source of information about that. And it is happening also in Indonesia. When I go to other provinces, to a couple of provinces, the idea 
of that Jakarta has been absorbing all the resources and leave them poor is something that is being strongly opinionated because of the source of information that they got from the social media coming from the same circle. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's number one. Uh, people have become polarized and opinionated. And number two, traditional wise, I think I would agree with that because a lot of things that we think it is our traditional values, it is not our traditional values. When we're talking about certain religion, could be either Christians or could be Islam, some of the values that we think, we, we become very strongly hold onto that. Uh, it is not actually our traditional values, mm -hmm. you know, because it is coming from outside, thought mm -hmm. from outside, from unfiltered source, and it, become, it makes us hold into something that is foreign, that is strange, that is not our traditional values. And that is the reason why connecting to your questions to the other speakers about digital influencers. And I was talking about there are unheard heroes out there who yeah. are not connected, connected to the social media. We need to, we need to bring them more. We mm -hmm. need to, to use them as, as, as the examples for young people to look upon instead of like just influences just people who have access to digital to be the source of the information uh, for these young people. Agreed. Uh, thank you. Interesting analysis there, uh, Billy. Now, I'm, we, I think we still have time for more questions. Um, maybe just short answers. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question from Jud Mutia from the University of Al-Azhar of Indonesia. Gen Y and Z are very active generations, especially on social media. But sometimes the way they give criticism and respond to issues are often too free or out of control. My question, is there a need for regulations that control speech acts in generations Y and Z on social media? Keeping in mind freedom of expression on social media is a point that is often discussed and fought for. Uh, I'd like to know if Mariko san if you have an opinion on this, but if you regulate the, the conversation in social media, what would happen uh, if that happens? Um, I, I, I don't think I have the direct answer to that, but mm -hmm. there's a similar, um, I think, issue seen in Japan as well. Um, mm -hmm. It becomes more extreme because, you know, social network, you know, you're able to express without even mentioning your name and that sort of adds to that extremism. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of it is has to be a combination. I mean, digital, uh, there are tools, right? And, and, and there was a mention from, I think, Sarah saying that you have to actually make use of the tools and get out there and yeah. make you know own actions. And when you do that action, I think what's useful is to sort of, uh, you know, not just among your own generation, but sort of the cross-generation exchange and learn sort of work together um, so that you, I mean, our generation, I think we have a responsibility to open up the spaces and allow these voices to come in or give that opportunities or responsibilities to, to our, the lower generation, because we are like a huge sort of a, sort of a thick, you know, sort of a, mm. what do you call it, sector of, of decision makers and ma mostly men, uh, I have to say still, I mean, the government politicians, the average age are like in the mid 50s, or some mm. can go up to the 60s in, in the municipality level, etc. And there was only one in the 20s that got elected this time, only mm. one. <laughs> and so it's, it's really crazy. And, and, and hearing a lot of the views from it coming from Indonesia, and I think Japan is really has to seriously really look into, you know, working together with these generations because I think you know otherwise we're gonna really sink so the so like yes the frustrations or I mean the opinions sometimes are really good or positive but they just need to have more experience learn more about it sort of you know try to look at the balance and um and 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 be more innovative that way right and come up with new ideas that way so I, I think rather than regulating I, I hope there's a more positive way um, um so that you know it can be turned into a positive force. Thank you, Mariko-san. Now, Mariko-san, I'd like to know your opinion. If you put control on these uh, uh, freedom of, that they have now, what could happen there? You mean, right? <laughs> oh, the freedom yes, they you. have now? Um, I think, I don't know. Um, sorry, may I change the answer to the question that you've given to the Mariko-san, maybe, um, um, I don't know. 
what what to do with the depression and the s yeah so it, it'll be interesting oh. like like the gen y and z they, yeah. they have the freedom to express so. yes so yeah 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 so that was a question so um i think that is um still okay but instead what i think they need is two things one is education on how to confront with the digital how to uh, not to be too consumed by those uh, what they see Another thing is the education on the self-esteem as well. So especially in Japan, I think, but the we're not taught to be have like high self-esteem, more about the try to have a self-criticism to be better self. And then that if it comes together with the digital, it becomes a bit um, it forces you to have more self-reviewing and might lead it to the self-depression. So I think. Um, freedom is, yes, I think it's quite important, as Mariko-san mentioned, because it can create the positive causes that we're seeing in Japan as well. So what I think um, is needed is education on the how to uh, protect their self men uh, men mentals and the how to treat the digital in a very nice way. Not by control, but by educating. All right, yeah. thank you. Uh, I'd like to know just shortly your opinion as well. Uh, I'll start with Sarah first. On exactly the same question. Well, number one. Exactly the same question. Yeah. So number one, uh, I'm one of those who believe that if you have too many regulations, it actually shows a decline in your civilization. <laughs> uh, because when you need to regulate everything, it, it actually shows that you're lacking in the education sector, you're 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 lacking in in mental health uh, education, and and that's the other thing that I will say is uh, you know we're seeing a lot of cyber bullying here in Indonesia, and that's why the question is posed. We we're seeing a lot of cyber cyber bullying, uh, you know, and and criticisms that are not uh, it's not constructive criticism. It's really just hate speech. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that and it's very unfiltered and it's very unhealthy. I was basically, that was exactly what, you know, we, we say like, you know, makanan sehari -hari. that's what I was literally like, oh, that was my consumption every day, day in, day out uh, during elections. And especially during the times of uh, highly contested issues. I want, during the sexual abuse eradication bill, um, in my in my period that, that that's how long the discussion has been taking place it's been taking place for years um but during that debate i one time i was being sent like literally i, I would call it terrorized by hundreds of messages coming on onto my personal number so my personal number was already being spread out um and and their buzzers were already being told to send uh, every single one of us that are, you know, all the politicians, you know, all the representatives messages saying that they want us to stop that discussion. They are against us passing the sexual abuse eradication bill. So, um, so I think it's, it's, it's not a regulation to, we already have ITE and even that, you know, the, 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 the whole, even that regulation that is regulating free speech in a way, um, mm. uh, uh, you know, on, on the digital in the digital world is already being contested because it's so it, it is very much yeah. you know and even there is there is a law that states you you know if if you criticize the president you can go to jail so yeah, you'll be fined i mean that's already uh you know basically putting uh you know uh, limitations on free speech, but I think it's not necessarily about it's not about regulation. I agree with uh, Mokasan when she said it's it is about education. But what specifically we're educating? We need to educate critical thinking, and what it means by critical thinking, it's how to relay your thoughts in a constructive in a constructive way, not in just simply cr critic, just for criticism's sake, you know, uh, just to appear. We have a saying, Tong kosong nyaring buninya here in Indonesia, as in you speak a lot, you talk a lot, but you actually have nothing to say. So, so you know, so it's very, uh, it, so the education and, and critical thinking is, is very critical. Um, but the other thing is about mental health issue as well, that everyone, mm -hmm. so it's, this is full circle. Everyone's been saying, mentioning about mental health. 
we really need to really look into that because it is affecting the mental health of the youths and any of the uh, med social media users here in Indonesia. Um, okay. and, and the bullying is happening and it's happening very badly. Um, yeah. and, and, and we have we have suicide rates going up because of it as well. So, and I think Japan's been dealing a lot with, uh, with you know, mental health issues with suicide rates as well to do with that because they're so isolated. And with mm -hmm. this pandemic, that's the only way they get in touch with the outside world. Um, you know, and I yeah. remember watching a documentary where in Japan, you have youths who are so afraid of getting out of their room, you know, their house, they literally stay inside all the time. Um, and here in Indonesia, we really need to be aware uh, of that, uh, okay. uh, you know, potentially happening. Thanks, Tim. I agree. So uh, I, I'd just like to give probably a half minute to Billy, uh, your comments on this uh, to, wrap, to wrap us up. I think it's, I think it's well covered, Timothy. I agree with every single point that was made by this wonderful female speakers. <laughs> smart people yeah thank you very much billy uh and i'd like to thank everyone however i've already passed one minute from my allocated uh, time. i just want to minutes. touch one thing sure. uh timothy just want a very short thing i think uh, uh extending from sarah's point about that young people uh, know aware and care but they don't know how to you know be involved I totally agree with it. I think in our talks today, we tend to put the young people as the main or as the, the only subject that they don't want to, to be involved in solving the problem. But don't forget that when we're talking about the government, there is also inequality in the government in terms of capacity between mm -hmm. the national government, provincial level government and regency governments and different provinces have different capacities. My uh, experience when I went to different provinces, there are a lot of wonderful young people who have been doing great things and they, and they want to involve, they want to help the government. But the government feel like, no, you're young, you don't know a thing. We don't want to keep doing what we want to do as what we do. So I want a movement for kind of, you know, revolve the way the government, especially in the local governments, uh, do things to have a willingness and open heart to involve the young people to work together with them. Because if we do that, if we do that, Indonesia will be, I think will be one of the strongest nation in the world just even before 2030. If that happens, mm -hmm. we're ready. Right. We're gonna be beat Japan, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably hard to do. So th thank you very much once again, uh, Billy. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Thank you, Mariko-san. Also, thank you, Mokasan, for the very insightful conversation. I hope we can have these conversations more in the future. Uh, especially as we'll be seeing more and more from Gen Y and Gen Z, especially Gen Z as they're starting to uh, come into the, uh, to the world, to working life and so on, we'll see how, that, how they will shape our world in the future. So it's exciting to see and we have high hopes for that. Uh, I hope you all success and health in the future in your respective areas. Thank you very much. I'll just give it back to Sasa right away. Thank you. Thank you, Mastim and our speakers for their great insights.